There was a, a war in, in Mozambique that, you know, took dog, African wild dog, painted dogs or wild dogs, depending on, you know, what, what term you want to use, um, out, of the, out of that country in Africa. And they started to, you know, bring them back to the park after the country stabilized and, you know, post-war and, 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 you know, had success. You know, an animal that was now off the radar, totally gone, is now coming back because, you know, humans are doing the work. Welcome to The Possibilists. The Possibilists is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective and continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. In this episode of The Possibilist, we talked to Brian Masuga of Peppermint Narwhal. Peppermint Narwhal is a media company that focuses on telling conservation stories, including sharing the stories of endangered species, conservation success stories, uncommon knowledge about nature, and much more. This episode will be best enjoyed on video as Peppermint Narwhal provide mostly a visual medium. We've been fans of them for such a long time as they do amazing work, and they have a wide variety of topics and styles so please enjoy our conversation with Brian and check out their website at peppermintnarwhal.com and social media to see their work. Brian, welcome to the Possibilists. Uh, it's we're super happy to have you. Um, we're we've been, as we've kind of mentioned to you many times, we've been super fans of uh, Peppermint Narwhal for for so long, and we're really excited to be able to talk to you about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And yeah, welcome to the Possibilists. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I've I've really been uh, enjoying your show too, so uh, I'll do my best to be an entertaining guest for you today. (laughs) Awesome. Um, Well, I guess let's just get started by kind of like, can you explain um, what Peppermint Narwhal is? And maybe you start with the name. I love the name. It's great. But why? (laughs) What what is a Peppermint Narwhal? (laughs) Yeah, so um, I think that you know, when you're, when you're creating a, you know, call it a brand, uh, you know, it's a term in the creative space. You probably certainly heard it because it's become pretty mainstream. You know, even nowadays people refer to themselves as brands, you know, your, your, your organization is a brand. So when you're sort of creating a brand, uh, I think one of the most important elements is a story, you know, a brand is really a good story. And the more compelling the story, the more you will engage your audience. Uh, we've all been in a room or the water cooler where somebody's telling a great story. You came in a little late and you almost inject yourself into the story because you're like, hang on, catch me up. I, I'm curious. I got to know this. Uh, so stories pull people in. You know, we're we're literally our culture and our history and traditions are built on stories. So brands are really no different. So when I create a company or a brand, I, I, I sort of try to sort of start with a story and find what, I, what what's going to be fun for, for me, for our audience. Um, so I think a good story a lot of times has some simple elements, uh, you know, borrow from the familiar and then, you know, mix in the new, unique and unexpected. When you kind of toss those together, you make some some interesting magic, like getting the familiar in there makes people think like, oh, wait, I think I saw this. I, you know, I, I know this or there's something there for me. Uh, so and it's not too familiar that they're like, oh, I know what that is. It's boring. I've already seen it done. Move on. Like we see a ladder and we don't think too much about ladder during the day. Um, You know, it's just a common object name. But when you kind of bring these things together in unique and interesting ways. So I sort of looked at, you know, loving animals. The narwhal is like the most unique, possibly arguably fantastic animal on the planet. It's tied to unicorns. Uh, People sometimes don't even believe it was real because it's so fantastic. Uh, So that animal became really interesting to me. Um, I started to think like the, the Moby Dick story, like, you know, the white whale among sperm whales, he's already fascinating, monstrous animals. And now there's one even more amazing. So I thought, well, what would a unique narwhal be in all this already unique, crazy, amazing animal? Uh, so I sort of looked at the, the tusk, you know, kind of, 
this is a little bit of fact and a little bit of you know my own interpretation but you know it's essentially a tooth the fact is it's a tooth inside out so it actually has sensory elements on the outside as opposed to our soft and sensory stuff is on the inside of it or all other animals it's on the inside of the tooth so the narwhal is completely unique in that respect too so i sort of looked at the tusk and i thought it kind of looks like almost like spun candy cane taffy you know spun candy cane so i was like oh peppermint narwhal i started to to, to play with that and you know i when i was starting our company and you know we're essentially a two-person team you know a lot of times you'll see me on screen but there's you know, my wife Becky who kind of does everything else um, keeps me in line too. Um, so when I was showing her the ideas, I wrote, wrote a list of company names and I, I got through two and I think the third one was Pepper and Narwhal. And she said, stop, done. That's it. You know, and so, so I, I, I think a good brand name is something that you want people to ask you, wait, what is that? Tell me the story. You know, if you can evoke them to ask you the question, then you sort of have the captive audience that you need. You know, I think you, you telling that story, it just, just reiterate exactly how I feel about what you guys do. Um, because while I'm, you know, we're scientists, I'm a biologist. Uh, I, I've learned so much from your guys' art. And I had no idea that the, the tusk of a narwhal was turned in, it was a inside of a tooth kind of spun around. It's like, so that's, that's mind blowing. So when I can see a, a quick infographic and it has visually stunning art, but also just a quick thing that makes you go, oh, that's so cool. It just, for me, it reminds me why I got into biology, why I got into animals. I've always been an animal lover. Um, and so I think that's what's so cool about what you're doing. And so I guess that's a good segue to kind of, you guys kind of focus on on animals and the environment, whatever you want to call it, conservation. Um, what, I guess I should say, you're a visual artist. <laughs> so, you know, if you're listen listening to this, then uh, we'll, go to their social media pages or go on the YouTube to actually watch this because we'll, we'll, we'll show some of the art. Um, what was it that got the, what, what was it that was the inspiration for you to, to focus on conservation or just animals in general? Sure. Um, you know, as a kid, I, I, I've always loved the animals. I mean, the only thing I didn't love more than animals and nature was probably, you know, creativity. You know, that, that's sort of why, you're a biologist and I, I'm a creative person. You know, I had to choose eventually. And I think, you know, you have these, sometimes these tough paths where you really are fascinated and interested in two things. But animals were right from the start, uh, something I was interested in. You know, I, I grew up with a kid that, you know, I had a bigger family and, you know, my dad was very frugal. My family was very frugal, not surprisingly, and we didn't have cable. So PBS became like, you know, my favorite channel. And, and you know, I, I, I watched animal shows, you know, I, I get, books that were animal books, you know, uh, Nat Geo, you know, uh, even Ranger Rick as a kid, you know, and, uh, you know, so going to out into nature, right? A lot of times when we traveled, I, I love to go to museums, zoos, aquariums, you know, uh, nature spaces and, you know, see things and explore things. And uh, so that was always at a core for me. So I think it, it just eventually what, what really sort of converged for me was, you know, when I, went to college, you know, I, I sort of focused on my creative stuff and even the animal stuff kind of, I didn't spend a lot of time focusing on that there uh, because, you know, I was just trying to get my craft down, be serious. I wanted to, you know, listen to the teachers and do everything right and absorb as much as I can. But later as I kind of got out of school, I started to realize, well, why don't I just get back to, you know, doing what, what, I, what I love and bringing these two things together. Uh, and I really think that, especially as a creative person, as I was looking to make a career out of this, I decided, well, you know, you got to love what you do or you're not going to do it very long or do it very well um, or you're just not going to enjoy it. So, you know, by choosing that passion, I, I started to, you know, look at, well, you know, why not work with clients that, you know, have animals and, and talk about animals. And that sounds like a pretty good way to sort of work. And then that sort of expanded even beyond that, where we started to realize you know, maybe we don't even need clients to talk about animals and to talk about nature. Maybe we don't have to own, you know, animals or have a facility or, or even be out there in the field. Like, you know, we could just be an artist talking about these things. And because I've, you know, I've always been a nature nerd, I, I have a pretty, you know, I consider myself a really good generalist. You know, I, I can hold my own with people, you know, that have 
you know, a lot of background on the subject, but, you know, I'm not going to go toe to toe with them. I, on a broad level, I, I know a lot and I love learning. So I love finding people who are smarter than me, learning from them and then kind of introducing that into my work and then sharing it with a broader audience too. Uh, I think that sometimes a cool angle with what we do is that, you know, we find people like, like you have a, a background in, you know, biology. We, we don't, but there's, sort of a, con a synergy that can be found here where, you know, sometimes we've worked with, you know, people who are like, hey, I'm trying to tell people this, what the problem is with climate change. And, you know, I got all this data, but it's like data is like, to the average person is like, uh, what, you know, what terms are you using? Um, you know, so where we sort of fit in is, you know, as by being pretty interested in this subject, you know, I can, I can get there faster than, you know, I think any designer can design it any illustrator can, you know, jump into any field, but they're not going to feel as comfortable or natural with one that's very foreign to them. Whereas if you were interested in it, you already know the vernacular, you already know a lot of terms. So when you don't, you can ask questions quickly and get caught up pretty, and you kind of have a, an interest in it. So your, your brains, it's just easier work. Uh, so that's sometimes where that collaboration comes pretty exciting. We'll work with somebody who's, you know, like a polar bear scientist who's trying to do a TED talk about, you know, how do we explain climate change and how do we make an infographic that maybe kind of gets people to really, Oh, okay. I got it. You know, and, and, and that type of thing becomes a fun sort of blend of that science and creativity. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny because I, I don't know about Taylor, but I don't consider myself a creative person by any means. Um, I can't draw. I'm terrible at music. <laughs> None of it makes sense to me, <laughs> but you know, in a weird way, you know, everyone has some kind of creativity that they have to get out of their system. Like it just, if you express yourself, you just feel better in many ways. And in a roundabout way, this is kind of what this project has turned out for me. So I feel like we're kind of coming to the same conclusion from the other angle, you know, like I'm looking for creativity uh, outlets, but coming from the conservation side of things and you're coming from the creativity and like getting involved with conservation. And I think it's so cool. Um, and one of the ideas that we you know, with this series specifically, and some of our other stuff, we've we've talked to some of the huge names in in, IC, uh, in the uh, yeah. in conservation. That's why, been, that's why I've been a little nervous to be on this show. I know that I know your guest list from the past. Yeah, no, and and we, trust me, we were nervous too. Like John Paul Rodriguez and and Thomas Lovejoy, and these these people are are like you know heroes in in this field, and we were we were so excited to talk with them. But one of the ideas is that conservation involves everyone so it, it anyone can do it and you don't have to be a biology major you don't have to be a climate scientist you can you can be an artist and get involved and you know even if you don't get involved with your 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 job like you have the weekends you have you know social media or whatever it is to get involved and that's kind of where um well, we're super excited to talk to you because I think this is a good opportunity to kind of talk about the, the, the role of uh, art or creativity in conservation. And I think there's no better person to talk to than you, who is that basically that's your life right now. So how do you, you know, how do you think those two kind of come together and, you know, how do you try to inspire action through your art? Yeah. So I, I think that th there's a really great place for, uh, the arts in this conservation space. Um, and just sort of touching on, you, you mentioned this sort of, you know, your path and then realizing different, you know, broader paths or other paths that are out there and then finding this synergy of collaboration. I think that's really what's exciting about this time right now is that there's an opportunity for a lot of voices and there are a lot more paths than probably there were. And they're more, we're more empowered today than we were uh, where we have uh, more opportunities to do and leverage things like social media that, you know, our free resources for the most part, our low cost resources that, you know, can get you out there in a way that you just couldn't 20 years ago. And as far as a path goes, I think always the best path is, you know, the one that you're most interested and passionate about. Um, so your skills are there and your passion's there. And a lot of times I, I, I tell people, you know, that maybe talk about a path line. I'm like, you know, don't be afraid to say, if you don't see your path, make it. Um, there's certainly an opportunity to, to kind of make that path. So as far as, you know, mentioning the arts and role of arts, you know, I, you probably heard the acronym STEM, you know, and uh, I, I've seen lately the growing traction on, you know, building STEAM, which adds the letter A to it, uh, which is for the arts. Uh, so I, I think that it really does belong there. I think, you know, you've got, you know, 
these math, science, science, technology, engineering, math, those are all, you know, important ones, but the arts being missing there, I think is, is kind of lacking. So I like to say STEAM over STEM, uh, because I think that the arts create a bridge to communicating some of this stuff more effectively to broader audiences. I see a lot of science, I met a lot of cool scientists, many people smarter than me, and I, I, I see them, even though they're far more intelligent than me, they'll struggle with conveying complex things to other people that don't have that same pedigree background and familiarity. Uh, so that's sort of where the arts come in is that when you really think about humanity, our, our first language was visual. Um, you know, cave paintings are the first art, the first form of multimedia mass communication. So, I mean, you literally have us drawing pictures from the start. Uh, so I think that that's, I mean, I, I'm a Nat Geo fan. I love, you know, the issues. But one of the first things I always do is, even as much as I enjoy reading them, is I still cheat and look at the pictures. You know, I flip the pictures, I go to the infographics, pick that out first before I go to the story. So we, we're visually biased, and that's uh, something where the arts really can leverage that. Uh, it's also visual bias of the audience, so they're more interested in seeing things. You look nowadays with social media, it's like you're just texting, typing something in the text box as opposed to not sharing a picture or video or some sort of you know, motion media, then, you know, you're almost, people just aren't going to connect with that because we're not very good at reading, unfortunately, even though it is a great skill and we should all do it more. Um, we don't like to do it by nature and it intimidates us. Whereas visuals, not a lot of intimidation. And they also are more, we're getting more comfortable expressing ourselves. So more people are comfortable once they get into a, like a, hey, I want to do something for this movement, they're more likely than to share something and, and be a little more adventurous and maybe do it a little more visually as well. So there's a, I think the arts have a great place in the conservation puzzle because it's a big puzzle. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, so I, I would definitely want to add that one to the toolkit. Taylor has been much more of a, a student of art. Um, he's got a degree in literature. And so you... Uh, maybe help me out with this one uh taylor there there's this quote i'm thinking of it might be carl sagan i can't i can't remember but there's a, a quote that said something like uh science uh investigates the world and the arts interpret it so we can understand it or something like that i, I can't remember the exact one but yeah it's eo wilson okay. uh so in eo wilson's idea of consilience um so that was his consilience idea that it's um, science uh, figures out truth, figures out data, figures out facts. And it's the humanities, it's the arts, it's the literature, it's, the, it's, it's how all that is made, incorporates what science understands. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I think that's very true. Um, so it's, you know, figuring out so many important things about our natural world and it's the humanities that say okay now here's how we integrate it into our daily lives and here's how we make it relevant to people and that's a it's a great idea austin that you're bringing up because it is it's exactly what you are doing brian it's your your as much as we are talking to some heroes in conservation um you're the one and your work is making it relevant um to everyone else other than the small amount of people that, you know, the, the conservationists work with. So you're making it relevant to everybody and making it understandable and making it accessible and giving that invitation and opening that door to so many people. And I think it is that, that consilience of the two. Yeah. We certainly couldn't do anything really interesting if there wasn't scientists finding really fascinating things to share, like, you know, uh, when I learned an amazing fact, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't own that fact. I didn't go out and, you know, look at the narwhal tusk and, you know, study it and, and, you know, but, but by that collaboration, that's why I think, again, this is a complex tapestry. We need a lot of people with a lot of diverse backgrounds. I mean, sometimes the benefit of creativity too, is it sees the unexpected. It asks the weird question. Um, you know, it's not, we're afraid to be embarrassed. So, you know, um, I think that's sometimes the voice of creativity in the conservation space is that, you know, you're looking for the outside vantage point 
um, you know, from the reverse angle, what does it look like? What is it, you know, have we ever thought of, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I like to say, you know, you hear everybody say the, the old cliche, there's no dumb questions. Well, I, I like to say, certainly there's dumb questions, it's just timing, you know, so ask a lot early, you know, and then you don't look as dumb later. So, you know, I think that's where the creative side is very question based, you know, and, and so is science, we just I think see questions a little differently, um, you know, whereas I think when those two questioning ideas meet, you get some really fun things. And, and humanity has done amazing things when these two things meet. I mean, we're using technology here that's a blend of people who contributed, seeing the creative side and other people who said, well, you know, how, here, how are we gonna make this thing work technology-wise or innovation-wise? Like I said earlier, I, I, I've learned so much from you guys' work and the uh, infographics and just things I've never, never even heard, like animals I've never even heard of, like we were talking about earlier. I think before, even a few years ago, I'd never heard of a pangolin, <laughs> you know? And, and I think specifically of like, um, what are they called? The axolotls. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you see them at, we see, see them at the aquariums or zoos or whatever, or you see a, a video of them and they're so cool looking, but I still can't not I can't look at them without thinking of your representation of it because they just look so happy and they're cute you know <laughs> especially when you guys draw it well we, we, they, that's a, that's an important element of actually something that we're intentionally doing all the time you mentioned cute you know like there's a certain Disney actually once well Disney actually came up with a formula that that, that played to the, this proportional ratio of a baby. Like we have literally in our reproductive cycle, a, a baby emotes certain connections that, you know, we like to think are all altruistic, but a lot of them are biological. And there's certain proportions of a baby that you're just drawn to big heads, big eyes, you know, happy face, you know, sort of stout, doughy little things. And when you look at cartoons, they exploit that. They, they take, and Disney actually came out and said, you know, hey, we, you know, we, we leverage these proportions of, you know, the happy, the fun that connect with people that play on these, you know, parental instincts and make us more connective. So when I think, you know, you're using, you know, things that are fun, it's the best way to learn. I mean, you really can't learn unless you're having fun or else it's quite tedious. And oftentimes you, you really struggle. But when you're having fun, you almost don't realize you're learning and you're just absorbing, you can't get enough of it. So I think that that's something we're usually leveraging. That's why we're not above using humor, whimsy, other, you know, or, and that's where sometimes, you know, coming from the creative space, I'm not too worried about someone, well, I don't I want to be taken seriously. Like, okay, most of the time, probably, but not all the time, you know, and, and, and certainly uh, social media being a recreational fun space where people are going to relax, to get up. No one's really going there to say, you know, I want to learn about the pangolin and how I could save it, you know, uh, but they can make that connection uh, if you sort of subvert uh, their entertainment and, and, and win them over in a way that, um, you know, it's a little more playful, a little more engaging. I mean, otherwise you're just going to get lost and not seen. I, I think this is a, a great, great opportunity to kind of talk about, you know, some of your specific work, uh, you know, I, I was, Taylor and I were looking at your, the calendar that you sent us uh, and I was noticing there's a difference. And again, I'm not an artist. I don't know how to explain any of this in the right terms, um, but there, if we were looking at some of them, I'm thinking of like um, the slipper lobster yeah. uh, compared to like um, your image of a, of a, like a red wolf or something. And the, the, the lobster is more, what's the word? There's more like, uh, there's humor. less... Th there's Playful. less details. Yeah. He's wearing bunny slippers. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Slipper lobster says so there's less detail. It's kind of like larger, just sections of, like, of, of colors. But then if you look at like a wolf or one of the other ones that they have so much detail, it's yeah. like the fact that you can do both of that, it just blows my mind because I, you love the ones that are just like, kind of, like you said, more simplified and they look cute, like a panda, like they're, they're super cool looking. But then when you see like an image of a wolf that's done in the way you do it, it's so cool. Um, and I, I guess like what what's the decision? Yeah, <laughs> and they're and like like you said they're they're fun like it's a the, the, the mustache. What is that, Taylor? It's the it's the the blue Nile patas monkey. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, the mustache series is an example of well, as you can see, I have some pretty crazy facial hair myself. Uh, so I, I and everybody on this podcast appreciate some facial hair. So uh, 
Yeah, that's a Zooflake series that we do. So you know, one of the things we I've done as a creative person is um, I try to create series. Um, first off, creatively, I never want to, I don't know, some people really get into their style and they celebrate their style as just this is this. Um, I think you're, you're both, you know, blessed and doomed to have style. You know, you're always going to have it to some extent. Uh, but I try to extend mine as much as possible. I like to, you know, I have a lot of influences. I have a lot of, as you can see, I'm kind of, you know, influences all around in my background. So, you know, I like pulling from things all over the place, even in unexpected places. So I like to have styles where I could draw playfully. I could draw like the, you know, Slipper Lop is an example of a style we call humor where I'm just, it's almost like a, you know, a cartoon, you know, I'm just trying to play with, you know, I want people to realize the name of the animal was given because it resembles a slipper, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's flat and stout and looks like something under your bed, um, you know, so it's not as, you know, like a main lobster, which, you know, has the claws and a lot of articulated legs and, you know, its anatomy is more um, out there as, as, as far as the slipper lobby being so condensed. So I, I played with that name, like, so I want you to know about slipper lobster. It's not even an animal that's as popular as common. So I was like, well, why not just go with the slipper thing? We're getting ready for bed. You know, you got your bunny slippers on and, you know, so I play with that dual meaning a little bit. And in social media, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, it's going to be, wait, what did I just see? Um, you know, sometimes you only have a second or less to get somebody's attention. Uh, so that's where I use different styles and different series so that I can kind of come at you from the unexpected way. You never really want, we, I, I, permanent now, I never really want you to figure us out because I haven't figured it out, you know? So, you know, how should you? So the more I have as different styles that I can play with, different series that I can explore, uh, I think that diversity is what keeps people coming back. I, I, a lot of times I say creatively, you're only as good as your details. I love that, Brian. That's really amazing. Um, do you, mind telling us about your different series like going through and telling because i know you guys have zoo flakes um and i know you have uh, the the fact the fact ones the uh, what do you call them uh, now you know yeah we we have a number of different series uh, if you want like i said i could uh earlier when we were chatting i, I said we could sort of look at these uh, screen things so maybe that'll be a little more okay so again for people who aren't seeing these um, you know, essentially we, we, animal holidays is a great example of a series that we like to do. So how do we, they're topical, they tend to trend on social media. So a lot of times we want to bring a little bit of educational fun or just, you know, interest to it. You know, this time it's just, you know, boom, hippo day for hippo's sake. Um, you know, sometimes it's adding a fact like national bilby day, you know, and telling about how the population is doing, uh, you know, it was just recently plover day, plover appreciation day. So what is a plover? How do they fit into things? We have series like All But Not All, where it's like some of these animals, like all, all newts are salamanders, but not all newts are salamanders. This one's a, a one that, whoops, uh, this one here is uh, the Know Your Penguins graphic was kind of one of our biggest first really trending graphics. Uh, I, I sort of, I always love field guides and I wanted to find a way to tell people, like I was a three, I had three sisters, I was the only boy. And I love field guides, I'd share them with my sisters and they just never got interested in it. So another reason I like having different styles is, different styles appeal to different audiences. I might, you know, appeal to someone who's more serious with a more literal style, but that's boring to somebody who's maybe looking for something a little more fun. So what I did with the Know Your Animal series was in the Know Your Penguins was the first one was, I was like, well, how can I tell, there's a lot of penguins. You know, I was fascinated as I was learning about penguins over the years. I was like, a lot of people don't realize how many there are. Um, so how can I show that to them? And then morphologically, how can I sort of, you know, convey that to them, but also do it in a way that's social media savvy, like fun, playful posters. I mean, I collect toys, I collect, you know, art, you know, uh, creative thing. I like graffiti art. So, you know, I have all these different influences. So I was like, well, how can I do something that's a little more, you know, pop, fun, cool, but still has, if a scientist saw this, they would look at it and be like, yes, yeah, pretty good. They got some of the anatomy and they're the important anatomy too. So this Know Your Penguins graphic, I, I had posted it was actually had a difficult time. My dad was having a triple bypass that day. And I remember the day I posted this, I was at the hospital and it was very quiet in the waiting room. And all of a sudden my phone, I hadn't turned it, you know, to silence because we were, you know, getting some family stuff. And, uh, but all of a sudden I started making all these beeps, like it was beeping and beeping. And I was like, what is going on? And my phones are broken. And it turns out there were social media alerts and this graphic was literally trending. It was now being seen by over a million people. You know, it had uh, a huge amount of impressions and, you know, we had never posted a graphic like that. 
um, you know, that just sort of blew up. So um, that was pretty cool. And that was also where for me, I saw, okay, hey, this Know Your Penguins is really a series of Know Your Animals. Like, how can I sort of take that to other people? And then, so we started expanding the series. Over time, the series got a little more anatomical, but it still has its roots in like, you know, the happy faces, you know, the, the cute sort of, you know, oryx, you know, all happily waiting, even though, you know, a lot of oryx aren't doing this well conservation wise. Uh, but, you know, that happy face sort of identifies you quickly into it. And, you know, how can I throw a lot at you? Like, where are these found? Where are the, what are their scientific names? What are their conservation statuses? How big are they? You know, things like that. You know, you mentioned pangolins. Uh, well, did you know that there's, you know, essentially eight of them, you know, found in both Africa and Asia, and here they are, and here's their statuses. And so you can kind of see, and then here's the different genera of these, the pangolin species, they're spanned over three different genera, and you can kind of see that in the color bars that I put in this graphic. So I try to get as much sort of stuff into that. I work with some crocodile experts in some crocodile groups, and they were like, it'd be kind of cool, you know, there's a lot of crocodiles, it's even more, arguably, you know, you're a biologist, so you sometimes know, like, they want to split certain species into multiple species. There's always a little bit of that dialogue. I think as humans, we like to categorize things, but in nature reality, it doesn't really like a monotreme is a mammal, right? But they lay eggs. I thought that's like live birth, right? So, you know, there's a lot of these blurry lines in the, the nature space. Uh, so we just, you know, try to be making these animals cute, fun, but still anatomically accurate, getting in a lot of accurate information, scientific information. A lot of times as we've grown, we have the luxury of, connecting with a biologist or scientist now who can help me make my or be, our work better. Um, you know, I can bounce ideas off of them. You know, some of them are really patient collaborators who, you know, are willing to share their knowledge. And again, you know, finding unexpected animals or less, you know, the coelacanth has become a pretty popular animal because it was, you know, ancient and rediscovered, you know, we thought it was gone and now it's there. And you know, now there's two of them, if you, if you didn't know. Uh, the, and, you know, there's a decent bit of size disparity and regional place where you would find them. Uh, so, you know, the, that series, uh, again, horses, everyone loves horses. Well, here's the sort of you know, entire Equus family, you know, and that bear is another popular animal. We, we've done those kind of series. Sometimes we play with humor and, and holiday topics, like here's the Know Your Animal series, but, you know, we reinvented it for Know Your Swans. I was like, well, what about that seven swans of swimming? And I was like, well, you know, there's an arguing like seven, or actually are seven swans, but some argue eight. So I kind of put that in the title and, you know, made the swans swing around, gave it a little bit of holiday feel. Same thing with like, I'll have a blue, blue Christmas. Everyone knows that holiday song. Uh, you know, Elvis has a great version of it. But then I was like, well, let's look at the, you know, the, the, the hyacinth macaws genus and, you know, show it's, and they're all these great big blue parrot and macaw birds. So it kind of worked with, you know, mixing Christmas and, nature together in maybe an unexpected way. And sometimes just know your trash panda, know your pandas, where you got red panda, giant panda, and trash panda, the kind of common you know, term. A lot of people, we have raccoons all around us. You guys, I'm sure, have, and then locally as well, they're pretty well dispersed, but, you know, they just often called humorously the trash panda because of their banded sort of, um, you know, eyes and their, um, you know, the affinity for garbage. So, you know, we also have to feel like, I, I like going to aquariums a lot of times and, you know, I hear people say, oh, there's a boy shark going by. And I'd be like, that's actually a girl shark, you know, because I would know maybe anatomy to look for. And I was like, well, why don't, why don't places tell you more about that anatomy? You know, like rather than anthropomorphized personified, like a shark is a man. And, you know, this animal seems more sweet and cute. So it's probably more feminine. We have these sort of you know, bad biases or these bad definitions. So, but, you know, there are things like, you know, morphologically that you could tell an animal is a boy or a girl. So we have a male, female series that kind of ask that question, like, what, what am I looking at here? Um, you know, what would be those key traits? You know, some animals don't really distinguish themselves very well from each other sex wise, but other ones do. Uh, we have a series called Versus where we sort of look at contrasting things that maybe are similar or confusing or sometimes mixed up or misrepresented penguins and puffins, you know, not at all closely related, but do kind of look similar, do, you know, spend a lot of time in the water, eat fish, that kind of stuff, but they're not found in any of the same areas. So we kind of really break that down and help people get a better understanding of the differences between these two uh, types of owls, showing them, you know, what's the difference between the two owl families and, and you know, which, what traits would you look for in one, uh, comparing a blue wildebeest to a black wildebeest, you know, that kind of thing, sharks and rays. Um, we have a series called Really, where we sort of look at uh, a, a fact that almost is like 
wait, are you kidding me? Like, you know, jaw dropping, interesting fact, like, you know, the giant panda being the most primitive of all modern bears. Um, another fun one that we did was uh, uh, the, the sun bear's tongue is, I mean, literally, you see a sun bear tongue extend its tongue, it is shockingly crazy long, um, almost absurdly long. And that's for, you know, getting into uh, hollow logs to get out insects. It's a, it spends a lot of time eating. It's an insect, insectivore. It's, it's a big part of its diet. So it's going to eat a lot of that. So I was like, well, you know, who, who has a big tongue? Gene Simmons, you know, from Kiss, you know. So I was like, well, wouldn't that be fun to just see these two, like, you know, Gene Simmons kind of, you know, showing off his tongue and then the, the sun bear just doing the mic drop by saying, no, I got you cut. I got you beat. Uh, you know, and with this impressive long tongue. So, uh, you know, not even being afraid to use humor or something interesting. Uh, we do a series called Endangered, where we just really want you to know there's a lot of animals that are endangered. Some you know uh, and care about uh, and some that you just maybe don't know, but should because, you know, they're disappearing. So we try to give people an idea of the threats that these animals are facing, where they're found, you know, how bad they're doing or an interesting fact that maybe puts them into context. Um, you know, an animal that maybe you don't know, like the Sayolo and, you know, just giving you, a, you know, an animal that comes up on your radar unexpectedly. Um, you know, curiosity is always a, a, an area we pull from. A zoology terminology is another area where we, there's a lot of fun terms in science and none of them, a lot of them aren't commonplace. And sometimes when you're listening, one of my first challenges when I was trying to, you know, get smarter and up my own, you know, uh, biology, zoology game was just, you know, wait, what did they say? I didn't know. I don't know that word. They didn't contextually you can give me context clues in the sentence. So I'm a little lost now. So we sort of created this series to sort of just talk about, well, what is this term? How does it, you know, fit in like, you know, crepuscular animals, like a white tailed deer that's going to be active during the, you know, dawn and dusk period. And that's when they actually, you know, you'll see them most and, you know, different uh, interesting terms like, you know, saltation, the, the act of moving by hopping. You know, not a common word, but when you really, why not add it to your vocabulary? You know, it's a fun one. And uh, so, you know, again, these series have been uh, sort of fun to put together. We have one called Know Your Animal Groups, where we, you know, look at, you know, the thing that's fun about Know Your Animal Groups is a lot of them have like names that are tied together, like a stand of flamingos. So I was like, well, what if they're at a lemonade stand, you know, a pink lemonade stand, all the better. I was like, oh, OK, now you've got the ultimate stand of flamingos or a bloat of hippos at a, you know, a, one of those buffet bars, you know, that, you know, restaurants or, you know, clan of badgers all in sort of, you know, Irish kilts and, you know, put together a murder of crows at an actual crime scene, you know, police tape you know, sort of thing. So, you know, playing with those, you know, double meanings, uh, I think a lot of times you're going to remember things when they're more visual, you know, and, and you're more likely to see something than just read something. You remember things better when you see it. Uh, so Party of Jays, another one, you know, these sort of series, Roll of Armadillos. There's so many fun ones that it's really a fun playground for us. Uh, again, you know, these series, you know, as we like to, to put them out there, you know, fun facts like wombats produce, you know, cube shaped poo, you know, it's not, you know, it's a really odd uh, why, you know, it's a, it's a bizarre thing, but, uh, you know, and then sometimes in our comments, we can add a little more copy to it and explain some of these things. Uh, sometimes, like I said, we just like to use humor. Like, you know, we did a graphic once that was just a raccoon sitting next to a red panda and topically it was fall in the background. It just kind of said a raccoon was saying to the red panda, you know, don't you think you're overdoing a little bit with the pumpkin spice and, you know, come around, we're starting into the pumpkin spice season where, Starbucks gets it every suddenly there's every pumpkin spice cereal, you know, you name it, there's a pumpkin spice something. So we sort of played with those two animals look similar. So again, you know, the humor side of it, sand cat at the beach, playing it, you know, making sand castles, uh, you know, lasagna lizard uh, is a nickname for the uh, hellbender. So here you have this hellbender maitre d' stirring lasagna to the, you know, Garfield in his later years, not doing as well uh, because of all the bad you know, eating that maybe he's got diabetes or something setting in. Uh, so, you know, Spectacle came in at a, you know, eyeglass store, uh, you know, things like that, where you kind of take a little bit of the science, but then kind of, you're not afraid to be playful, whistling duck, just kind of walking on whistling, you know. And then you mentioned the Zoo Flake series, you know, we, around different times of year, some of our, our series, we just like to mix it up and we jump around and keep things fresh. Other times are seasonal, like Zoo Flakes around January when, you know, kind of, holidays pack up and for us we get a lot of snow where we're at or you know used to climate change is a little a little bit of a different story these days 
but you know, snow is kind of uh, a common January tendency. So I, I remember cutting out paper and, you know, as a kid to make those little snowflakes where you folded them out and you fold up the paper, cut it, and then open it up, you get a nice little snowflake and everyone's different. So I was like, well, what if I played with animal forms in that, you know, and, you know, kind of explored that. So I, I, as I did that, I started to find there was all these beautiful shapes that I would get and, you know, interesting relationships. So this is a series that's almost just more, you know, visual, but then, you know, I'll talk about the animal in the comments of that post so that, you know, here we did one on Humboldt squid. So I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, what the Humboldt squid is, where you find it, that kind of thing. So again, sometimes our stories are, and, you know, here's one that, you know, we did a pelican wingspan. You guys uh, certainly would appreciate have an affinity for the pelican uh, genera. So uh, basically, you know, just kind of comparing sometimes animals and interesting things like wingspan or size, how big is one versus the other. So any kind of little nugget that we can do, uh, we like to sort of uh, do that. Uh, this, this series gave me a chance to be not bored and always have something to jump around to. It also allows me with the facts to sort of say, hmm, this is interesting. Maybe it works more for a, a really series or, or I kind of like this animal, but I can't find really any way to maybe get in the mix. But the, the Zoo Flake series is just nice to see, well, it's got a cool form and I'll play around with that. So by having those, I, I get a bigger playground. And then also the audience gets, you know, never too figured out what we're trying to do, or, you know, it's always something changing or topical or fresh and new. Yeah. That, again, that was so fantastic. I, I love, I love the art. I love all of it. Um, but, you know, one of the, the things I've seen recently on your, on your page is your involvement with the IUCN and the reverse, the red. And I, I, again, we're very much in line with, with reverse the red. And we, we like the, um, we like that you guys are involved because it's more of a, you know, highlighting the, the conservation successes because we're, you know, one of the things we're doing is trying to prove that conservation works. So can you talk about your involvement with uh, the reverse the red movement? Yeah, sure. Um, that that's, because again, as I said, as we were growing social media wise and our audience would grow, uh, it, it, so the thing about social media uh, that's exciting is it connects you with so many potential people. I mean, sometimes you, know, you have, you know, you're putting yourself out there. So I think sometimes people are a little intimidated by that, but it's a wonderful opportunity. Most of the time you'll find you're going to make so many more positive connections than, you know, any fear you might have of a negative one. Um, but some of the nice positive connections is, you know, sometimes you actually meet people who can help you or you can help them, or there's these collaboration opportunities. It's not always just like, Hey, I like what you're doing. Good job. Um, which is still a great bit of feedback. And I appreciate that. But, you know, this was one of those ones where we were posting graphics and, uh, some people who were, you know, it, making this sort of IUC and reverse the red movement started reaching out to my wife, Becky, who, who's, I mentioned a partner here and said, hey, you know, I, we have these success stories, we want to tell them. We actually had done a series in the past where we were trying to get that sort of a series off the ground, but, you know, being artists and not, you know, having the data of the science, it was always a lot of big research projects. So I got a couple of them done and then, you know, series kind of fizzled out because it was a little too intense to do. Uh, but now I had somebody who was like, hey, we've got all this data, you know, and all these cool stories. So what I really liked about them, too, is that, you know, I grew up and yeah, I know you chose the, the pelican as an example for optimism, you know, as the brown pelican when I was growing up was like the American alligator. I mean, all the DDT was you know, wiping out, you know, ecosystems or animals in these ecosystems because they were just being toxified. So, you know, we were going to lose bald eagles. We were going to lose, you know, American alligators. We were going to lose brown pelicans. And now when you see these three animals, they're all doing fairly well. Um, and that's because we, we turned the course. We, we, in, we invested effort. We collaborated. We fixed problems. We, we chained, took off the pressures and the strains. Uh, so that when they said they had these success stories, I was very interested in it. Um, and then as we started, we did a little sit down, uh, feel each other out. Um, and, and it was just really exciting. I saw the success stories they were talking about. I saw these fun animals that, you know, Taylor Salamander, uh, you know, African painted dog, uh, you know, Hawaiian crow. I was like, oh, these are all kind of cool animals. It was just a, for me as a nature nerd, there was like this, this list started getting to be like, oh, I'd like to draw that, I'd like to draw that. You know, some of them I had covered, others I hadn't. So there was a lot of stimulation there. And then as I really delved into their success stories, I, I found uh, these things really are cool stories. And, and, and you know, they're complex. They're, 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 they're you know, they, they have these paragraphs that you find on IUCN, these case studies. 
uh, but you got to do a lot of reading to really get them. There's sometimes some of them have videos and, and those are helpful too, but to really get the whole story, you got to kind of do a lot with it. So the challenge for us was how can we help them in one little graphic, maybe at least electrify the story for them, at least maybe give them something that, you know, has some depth to it. Uh, so there's a bit of a challenging series because, you know, for me, I have to do a lot of reading, do a lot of watching that I do a lot of, like I was just working on one the other day that literally I spent all day on. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was for the Eastern Bar Bandicoot. And, you know, I was running into things where I'm like, wait, what is this island? Where is this island in? Where's it, where it in Australia are we talking about? So I had to learn about Australia geography, you know, and I was you know trying to spin all these plates as I was getting this, uh, you know, so the graphic took, you know, a sizable amount of time more than I might have liked. Uh, but, you know, I got the, the distilled and then, you know, as soon as I shared it with them, they liked it. And literally I was like, oh my God, it's posted already. Like it, it went up that same night. So, and that's kind of the weird, interesting thing about social media is that, you know, a lot of times the front end, maybe, you know, some of these things might take me hours to do like the know your crocodiles graphic that I was talking about. There's it was like 22 hours, you know, 22 hours to make that graphic and, 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 you know, it, and more of when you sort of factor in the research that you got to kind of do to really get ownership of it. Uh, but when you get it out there, you only have what one second. So, you know, that's just sort of, you know, interesting, uh, exciting challenge of social media it's like sometimes you know unfair but you know art's always had that you know you look at someone at a gallery you see someone who's made literally going up to like a masterpiece like you know uh you know van gogh starry night and they'll look at it for a minute and then they'll walk away you know some of those ones might get more than a minute but most of the other ones will get like you know one second too you know and this is like in fine art, you know, this thing's probably worth millions of dollars. And someone's like, that's eh, okay. <laughs> and they move on. So, you know, that's kind of the creative challenges. You've got short windows to connect with your audience. And, you know, how do you, how do you take advantage of that? Yeah. Are, are you able to, to show some of those or? or is yeah. There... Let me, let me share the screen again here. Um, and Austin, um, the, I, I don't know if you were going to ask this, but as Brian, as you've been talking, um, I would love to hear about your process because you mentioned 22 hours for some, it mentioned a whole day for other. At some point, I would absolutely love to hear what it, you know, when you start, is it you pulling out a piece of paper and a pen and drawing or, you know, tell us more about your process. I would love yeah, that. The, pro the process for me is a little bit of uh, where you'll, you'll find yourself doing a lot of notes, maybe early, sometimes sketching. Sometimes I'll go right into the computer. I mean, most of the time, the graphics that I'm working on, I work almost exclusively in Adobe Illustrator. I use a lot of Adobe programs, but, you know, and I draw native right into the computer. I have a Wacom tablet and I just, you know, draw and it draws like, it's basically like a digital piece of paper, you know, and it's a sort of weird way where I'll draw where, you know, I'm actually drawing on a tablet, but looking at a screen. So it's like, I don't watch my hand and, you know, um, but I think you could draw in any different way. I mean, I've drawn different ways in different parts of my life, you know, based off of whatever technology or opportunities were available. Uh, so, you know, I, I, a lot of times with the research for some of these graphs, especially for the IUCN stuff, you're looking at like, you know, like Taylor Salamander. I know yeah. a little bit about it, but not a ton. So I have to really sort of look at like, okay, you know, this is in the same, you know, you mentioned axolotl, these guys in the same, you know, genus. So it's a, it's a rel and it has that same, it's called neotomy where an animal has maintains juvenile traits, even as an adult, like typically you would look at, you know, an axolotl and you see those big gills that kind of, you know, look like this around the side of its face. Um, and most of those salamanders that would, lose that as they become an adult, uh, whereas axolotls never lose that. And there's a number of animals that do that um, exclusively as adults. And some that do it selectively are in weird regions where sometimes they turn into adults, sometimes they don't in different parts of the world. Uh, so it also kind of shows how evolution is probably working, like, you know, figuring things out and, and testing things as we go. You know, you don't always see a finished product in evolution. Sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a process. I think there's so many clues about you know, evolution across the animal kingdom when you really start looking for them. Um, so yeah, so the research is really important. Not only do I have to know more about this animal, I've got to know what, what, what its status was, how it got really bad, how they work together, you know, bringing an animal back, reverse the red is a cool idea, but it's a challenging idea. I mean, you know, unfortunately we live in, you know, the, the, you hear a lot of people talk about the Anthropocene and this, you know, six math extinction. Now, you know, there's still arguable terms that, you know, depending on what side of the science you are on, but they're certainly compelling because basically both of those talk about that humans are impacting the world. Few people argue about that. 
you know, and we're all altering the world in a way that's unprecedented. So we're almost becoming like a meteor, you know, when you're looking at the Cretaceous and the dinosaur period where, you know, you got a meteor slamming into the Yucatan Peninsula and, you know, annihilating dinosaurs and giving mammals a better chance to, you know, let us be here. Um, but now we're kind of like this, you know, force by the things we do where we use up resources, we exhaust uh, space, we're careless, we're selfish, uh, we're uninformed. Um, and that causes strains and like we introduce foxes to Australia and we're like, hey, cool, foxes are a beautiful animal. Why not put them in Australia? Well, they were never meant to be there. And now when you get this animal, sometimes we, we do the swallow a spider to catch the fly kind of logic. We're like, well, we introduced something. Now we needed a predator to fight this thing that's going bad from the first introduction. And it only makes things worse. So foxes, for example, in Australia, wiped out the Eastern Barred Bandicoot entirely on the continental mainland, uh, just drove it to extinct in the, in, in the wild. Uh, luckily, through human care, they were you know, some of these animals left. And you know, that's what really reversed the red are these kind of stories where somebody says, we can fix this problem. Uh, you know, another one is like the Hawaiian crow where, you know, right now it's still extinct in the wild. In fact, they, they did get it back out there. They've had a lot of success saving the species, but reintroductions are still tough because, you know, you got introduced hawks into the area. So these predators are so good at, you know, picking off animals. Like that's what an invasive species really is, is that there's no balance to it. So once you put something, you know, some of these animals that maybe we, we have in what we call like an arc where we, we could, we've saved them in some way, either genetically or, uh, you know, and, and through human care, they can still be difficult to get back out there because it's not as simple as just let them go, see how he does. Uh, because, you know, the strains are still in place and the, the, the limited resources or whatever these challenges the animal faced that drove them to extinction. So these problems are tough and reverse the red is this kind of cool story of, uh, you know, people doing uh, really exciting things where they work together. Like, you know, there was a, a war in, in Mozambique that, you know, took wild dog, African wild dog, painted dogs or wild dogs, depending on, you know, what, what term you want to use, um, out, of Afri out of that country in Africa. And they started to, you know, bring them back to the park after the country stabilized and, you know, post-war and, 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 you know, had success. You know, an animal that was now off the radar, totally gone, is now coming back because, you know, humans are doing the work. And the work isn't as always easy as just like dropping them in there. You got to do a lot of research, study, you know, see if the, the environment's going to sustain them. You know, these are long battles, uh, but there's been battles that we've been winning, corals. Uh, you know, you hear so much about bleaching corals and, you know, coral reefs are dying, but we're also growing corals now. We also have cryogenically saved sperm and, and eggs where we can, you know, uh, create corals. So, you know, humans are, are an amazingly innovative species. There's, you know, nothing. The reason we're a force like nothing's ever seen this on this planet is because of our, you know, our amazing brains. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we, we use them selfishly, but other times we, we can use them to solve problems. And sometimes as a bad tendency, we wait till our backs are against the wall uh, for really doing some things. But when you see a hurricane, when you see a tornado, you see so many people just showing their humanity and showing their willingness to, to get in the trenches and do the work. Uh, and unfortunately on the conservation side, we're in some of those, you know, the hurricanes hit, you know, there's a lot of damage. What do we do? How do we save these species? Uh, and reverse the red is really that kind of a, a fun way to do it. And, and sometimes you, you, you don't realize the, the extra benefits of fixing these problems, like, you know, reintroducing Eastern barred bandicoots to the mainland actually showed that soil quality in those areas of reintroduction group, because these are burrowing animals and they dig a lot. So, which is agitating the soil, introducing oxygen to it, you know, new, you know allowing rain and, and more minerals to transfer. Uh, so you actually improve soil quality when you have things like worms and digging animals. Uh, as opposed to the soil that's kind of very, you know, has no real animals, you know, interacting with it. the soil tends to get pretty unusable for us. So there are benefits to us when we also fix these problems. In fact, really most of the time, that's really our, our, our big puzzle is how do we find ways to, you know, you can't take away our willingness to benefit us because we're always going to put ourselves first. But how do you find that win-win where you're like, well, humans benefit here, but then we also kind of keep what we need uh, in place as well. And, you know, in the end, we're as dependent on diversity, you know, the, the world's diversity. So we might think we're this exceptional animal that isn't even, a lot of us don't even refer to us as animals. We're just, you know, oh, we're not an animal, we're something unique, um, something extra special, but we're, we're completely tied to the system and the 
system is dependent on all of these interactions. And if you start to throw one off too much uh, or take a key one out, you can really see things suffer. I mean, like right now, bees are a good example. You know, if you lose bees, you won't see humans around for too much longer because you know these key pollinators, we wouldn't have any food. So again, uh, there's some complex problems out there, but you know, there's also some great solutions that are being done. And we've, we've only really begun this series uh, with them, but there's really some cool success stories that you can see uh, that are being shared out there in this ICN reverse red. And also kind of showing how like, you know, sometimes it's not always easy, like the Hawaiian crow, some of these, even the American alligator, like that didn't happen overnight. That wasn't fixed, you know, the, pel the brown pelican. They didn't just sort of say, okay, no more DDT. And then boom, numbers, you know, there was a lot of things that had to happen. Even just getting people to stop using that took a lot of time. Like lead bullets right now are a big issue for animals that are uh, scavengers and they're dying left and right. You know, even the bald eagle, which we've been doing great, is now going back, you know, struggling uh, because you're, you're seeing a lot of now lead poisoning issues for, you know, they, they're, even though they're an impressive predator, they, they eat a free meal every now and then more than you think. Uh, so they're a scavenger too. So yeah, this is a cool series that sort of gives people a bit more hope, shows that, you know, this, you know, it's not just about like, you know, these are going to go away and it's our fault, you know, do something, but I don't know what to do. You know, here's, we have been doing things and we are doing things and, we, and they, they do work. If you take off the pressures that we cause, animals and nature don't really need our help. They just need us to not, you know, kind of, you know, put these strains or pressures on them. So when we kind of find ways to reduce those and then, you know, reintroduction in the right way, you know, you can bring a species, you know, back. And I'm sure the Hawaiian crow someday will be an even, you know, it'll be, its status will, you know, continue to reverse and we'll see it, you know, back out in the wild, just like the Eastern Barred Bandicoot just sort of, you know, got over that big hump. And, uh, you know, again, it got there because of us, but it got back because of us. So I think that's the real thing that's, you know, we're better than a meteor and that we can fix the, we are the problem, but we can fix the problem. Meteor is just this inanimate object slamming the earth at a certain speed and you're running out of time. But with us, we've got, you know, a lot of times people ask me what's my favorite animal and I've answered this question a lot of different ways. You know, um, I'd say, you know, of course, narwhals being peppermint narwhal, some other f favorite animals as a kid. Oftentimes we answer this uh, a peppermint narwhal saying the animal I saw last, which is a pretty great answer because anytime I see a new animal, I'm just enamored by it. But if I was to really answer it truthfully, I would say it's humans. Um, I, my favorite animal is us because we're the most amazing. And I trust me, I'm not diminishing, you know, narwhals are crazy amazing, but we have language, literature, arts, science, we share, we're, we're, you know, we're not a youth social animal, but we kind of work like that. You know, we're always sort of, sh you know, building on things that we don't have to do the hard work anymore. Octopus, great example of a super smart animal for such a primitive animal, but it does no sharing of that information. It's always got to just use it in the short life it has, and it can't build other, I mean, imagine if octopus were social, you know, they might be running the world. Uh, so, you know, our, our, our social nature uh, really gives us an opportunity to do amazing things. And look at what we're, we've gotten, commercial space travel is now on the radar, colonization of other planets. Um, we're an amazing species and we do amazing things. We've just got to kind of own a little bit more of our responsibility better. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the, the idea, you know, if anyone ever it's a little bit pessimistic. Like, well, at least we're better than a, a meteor. You know, <laughs> I like it's a that. dumb quote of the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, kind of building off um, the reverse, the red uh, idea and you know, your partnership with them and everything that you just kind of said. So, you know, with this series in particular, we're kind of exploring the idea of optimism and the idea of more specifically possibilism. And I know you just, you just spoke to that very, very well. But I think your perspective is, is unique uh, for, for people that we've talked to, because mostly we talk to people that are, you know, in the field, but, you know, you're kind of coming from the other side where you're a nature lover, but you're not like a researcher. And, you know, based off of everything you've just said, you, you know more than 99% of people in the world about nature. Um, and so, I, you know, kind of wanted to get your perspective on the idea of optimism and possibilism and how, how you think uh, you and your work kind of can uh, fit into that role. Well, this is a, maybe a good a way to sort of, again, tie it back to creativity. I, I think that, um, you know, I think that everyone should be guilty of delusions of grandeur. Um, you know, I think that's the best compliment that can be played to you, uh, paid to you. So, um, and the reason I say that is, you know, usually it's a term of like, 
you know, negative. Someone saying, you know, oh, you think too big, you'll never accomplish that. Uh, but I, I think that should always, everyone should strive for that. Uh, I think optimism is the only path because pessimism is like, we're done, game over. You know, it's, well, why do it? Um, and it's completely defeating. You're stuck. You have no momentum. It, it seems insurmountable. Um, there are things that I don't like that sometimes I make that kind of problem for myself, like, you know, maybe a chore around the house where I'm like, oh, God, I can't do this. It's, I've gotten so far behind it. But once I finally start doing anything, even just a small little bit, I start to see like, oh, that's looking better, you know, and, and I fix that. And then, you know, all of a sudden I get to this cathartic end where I'm like, I did it. You know, I, I you know, I, and again, that's why I think we should choose the things that we're good at, because then you don't have that hard journey of like not wanting to do it, you know, jump in and, and find your, your skill sets. And, you know, again, you, you can sort of accomplish things, but I think that you have really no other course than, than optimism. And I think that, you know, the, the, the world is always a bit of chaos and disappointing, scary, ugly. I mean, there's always a, a cute baby gazelle that's like, happy birthday, here's the crocodile, you know, and that's, <laughs> you know, a really rough birthday. But at the same time, there's also so many amazing things. And it's really just a matter of where do you want to put your perspective? Do you want to doom yourself and frustrate yourself and, 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 and nullify everything? Or, or do you want to sort of say, well, now I'm going to be an opportunity to make it better. I'm going to at least do a little bit. I don't know what my contribution will be, but I'm not even worried about that. Because again, that's why I think that delusions of grandeur just kind of makes you impervious to even getting too worried about it. You're just, I got to get this done. I got to do that. You know, when you're so motivated and passionate and interested, I think a lot of times you're not, you're not really worried about like, you know, is this working? Am I doing it? You're just so determined to get there um, that, you know, you keep doing it. So I think that again, fueling yourself with passion is this amazing uh, opportunity for superhuman endurance. Um, when you don't have passion, your endurance is terrible. You're not going to, you're going to hit the wall. You're going to quit. You're going to be the first one, you know, tapped out. I'm done. This is not for me. Um, so that's why I think, you know, really look at you making your own path. Even if your path seems like we don't, I don't really see a path for me. Then, then that's why you need to make the first path, show somebody else that there was another path here that nobody even saw. Um, and I think that, you know, when you kind of do that on your terms, uh, you really bring a bit of the positive to this. Uh, and you're seeing, you know, again, our potential, we, we, we are, we do fix problems. You know, we, we, you know, send a Hubble telescope and it has, oops, there's, can't see very well, there's a problem. And then we fix that. You know, and then it's like, you know, not only as amazing as it was, but even better. And we're looking what it's given us to vantage points to the universe and even our own planet. So, you know, we, we, we do know how to solve problems and the key is working together. And sometimes the best thing to do is just be willing to try, um, you know, using that optimism to create momentum because there's really no momentum in negative negativism. Uh, again, love that. Um, and, you know, one of the, the, the questions we usually ask right around now is, you know, how do, how do, uh, how do people get involved? How do, how do people, you know, how do you, what do you, when people say like, what can I do? Like, what do you usually say? And usually we're talking to people that run these big organizations that they can volunteer with or whatever. Um, and feel, again, feel free to answer that question. But I think um, for you specifically, a, a good question would be, you know, when it comes to creativity, and uh, art or, or, or whatever it, it is that people, uh, you know, find for their uh, creative expression. Uh, how, what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who, who wants to uh, get involved in the, the fight, I guess you could put it, in, in conservation, if they are a creative person? Well, I think there's so many ways. Um, what we should probably do is, you know, just do a little bit of self-inventory. You know, I think that you know, a lot of times, sometimes a tendency for a creative person, I think there's a certain amount of creative learning that you do where you study others and you, 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 you know, you learn from the masters. And I think that's important, but eventually, you know, I heard a great artist, uh, not maybe a common household name, but Giacometti, people in the art world would know, he was a sculptor who did more modern sculptures of the human body. And his, his sort of long, wispy human characters, almost look like line drawings. Um, and he said that he had this uh, statement where he said, you know, as he grew as a sculptor, he had to take everybody else out of his work um, and finally see what was left. Uh, so I think that that's really the challenge for a creative person is to sort of, you know, find yourself, 
um, and be true to yourself. So a lot of what I do, you know, like, you know, I, I mean, I, I like toys, I like pop culture, I like, you know, um, you know, design. And so I try to weave all these things together. But if you have different interests, you know, you should use your interest, not sort of see like, oh, this is the formula that that person is doing something successfully because you won't own it as successfully uh, if you don't sort of keep it true to yourself. So that's kind of the first thing is, is find your interest, passion and uniqueness, especially uniqueness, because there's not look, look at the narwhal. There's nothing more interesting than the unique. Uh, everybody gravitates towards unique. It's part of our own you know, selection in, in the universe. You know, we, we like things that stand out. Uh, so be something that stands out. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, you know, find that voice, be confident. Uh, I know, you know, a creative sometimes is people are self-conscious of it, but I think that, you know, the best way you grow creatively is by, you know, sharing your work. And sometimes you'll hear things that are negative and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a, you know, a condemnation of you. I think you're always, a phrase I use to guide myself is you're no better than your best praise and you're no worse than your worst criticism. So, you know, just sort of use that as like, average mean average where you throw out the best praise you ever got and you throw out the worst stuff you got and then you're more of what's left um so i think that you know you should never really over celebrate your success but you shouldn't be overly discouraged by your your failures too i, mean, I fail all the time I and mean, i'm always humbled by posting a graph and I'm like somebody's like oh your stats a little off or whoops you forgot cut and paste there i'm like, you know so i mean i make mistakes and and you will too on this journey but uh, i think that you know when you're sort of finding you and you're willing to learn and you're sort of, you know, not worried about the safety net below you and you're just kind of, you know, going confidently forward. I think creatively that there's so many opportunities now with, I mean, you know, recently I just read TikToks, you know, more people view vi videos now on TikTok than YouTube, you know, by volume, YouTube's still, you know, significantly larger, but, you know, as an overall trend, there's, there's a, a whole new market. So markets are opening up for different age groups, different audiences, different interests. There's always something new that, that you can take advantage of. So again, you don't be afraid to explore uh, as a creative person. That's kind of one of the monikers. Have a lot of influences and do a lot of exploration and you know, learn from your mistakes and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll start to put together momentum. There's really no greater momentum of anything than just do it and repeat, do it and repeat. I mean, that's kind of what evolution did. And it's kind of up with some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, with all that said, where, where can people uh, find you and, and, and your work? Uh, you know, either on social media, your website. Uh, you know, I know you guys have a shop. Like, can you can you, uh, can you share that with everybody, and we'll put it up on screen as well. Sure. Uh, social media is a great place to find us. Uh, it's one of the areas where most people know us as a brand, and every day we post something, so you're always going to get a new animal information. Uh, you know, kind of pulled from whatever is either trending topically or of interest to us. Uh, so that's, you know, you can find us on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, YouTube is something that we're done a little bit with, but trying to expand our, our goal in the future is uh, we want to take our still graphics. And I mean, originally as a creative person, one of the things I aimed at early on, or thought I aimed at early on as a kid was animation. And I haven't had an opportunity to really indulge in that as much, but I'm trying to steer us towards that as well. So I'm sure you'll be seeing more of us expanding in that social media space as well. But there's, you know, some of the common ones you'll certainly find us with Twitter as well. Um, we do have a store. A lot of times, uh, you know, people were coming to us over the years and saying, you know, I like that narwhal drawing that you did. Can I get it on a shirt? Or I would just want it on a shirt. You know, so I was like, hey, can I, you know, give it to my wife? I'm like, give me this as a shirt for Christmas. You know, that kind of thing. So the store sort of was an outgrowth of that where we were just, you know, making stuff for ourselves or other people were seeing things that we made it. And then it sort of grew the calendar. And now we sort of, you know, have a number of product lines that, you know, for people who are animal lovers. And the nice thing about that is, you know, the store is something that then, you know, we try to reinvest all the time by either, you know, selecting a charity that this graphic or this piece of art, uh, artwork or this merchandise goes to support this audience or this cause. Uh, sometimes it's uh, also, uh, you know, an opportunity to fund our own philanthropic work where, you know, all the IUCN stuff uh, we do as pro bono because we're, we're interested in the cause. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not paid for these uh, graphics, but we get passionate about it. So, you know, having those paying the bill things help us, then, you know, do those kind of things, uh, which, uh, you know, is how we like to impact the world. Yeah, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, it's been so fun talking with you and learning more about your work and, and seeing all the different series you guys have. And yeah, again, we're, we're super fans. We've, we've loved uh, what you guys put out. And it's, it's so cool. We can see it every day too. 
So yeah, thank you so much. And uh, say hi to Becky for us and the dogs. <laughs> yeah, I sure will. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. We want to say thank you so much to Brian for taking the time to talk with us and please check out their work on their social media pages and website. They do really amazing artwork and they are very instrumental in getting conservation stories out there and sharing the love of nature. Hosts and producers for this episode are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producers are Kat Coots and Andrea Santi. Music for this episode was provided by A Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. And thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.